Well, good morning. It seems we've managed to empty part of the theatre by, by moving ourselves on stage. Uh, that was a, a, a fascinating insight into air traffic control and probably quite nerving, actually, for one that flies quite frequently about how complicated it is and how much is actually based on data and technology. Um, I just wanted to run around the, the, the panel and just I'll start off with, with uh, Simon, actually. With, if you want to take the mic, um, just where they see a little, little bit about what they're doing and um, some difficulties that they're overcoming within their industry in particular. Okay, so uh, good morning, everybody. Um, my current role is head of operations for Cardiff Bus. So we operate uh, a network of 200 buses every day in and around the Cardiff area. Not quite reaching the uh, Celtic Manor, but not far from here. Um, uh, basically, I suppose in the last five years, there's, there's been something of an explosion in uh, digital technology in the bus industry. And um, to, to give an example of that, the, from an internal perspective, uh, although we don't operate in the sky, but on the ground we do something very similar to what Simon was uh, saying in his presentation. So all our uh, buses basically are throwing back live data, uh, location data as to where they are, how many people they've got on, whether they're on time. Um, and hopefully traveling as, uh, as safely as possible. So basically we have a team of, uh, of supervisors in our control room who are monitoring this information to try and make our services as reliable as possible for our customers. Um, and effectively that, work, that can work really well when, uh, when you have a, a reasonably calm day in the, in the city. However, if you've got uh, one direction playing at the Millennium Stadium, that can be a, a bit of a challenge as we saw over the weekend when you've got thousands of people coming into, uh, into Cardiff and the city is closed. So we try and use that information as much as possible. All that information then is fed out into our real-time information system, so people with the app on bus stops, people can tell where their bus is um, and how, how far it's, uh, um, how long it's going to take. Basically, the bus is a, you know, it's, it's, it can be very unreliable if there is an issue in the city. Um, safety is critical. Uh, similarly, the, um, the buses are throwing back information about how the bus is driven. So we try and use uh, uh, all the intelligence with our drivers to, to try and make them as safe as possible. And I suppose that entails one of the, the biggest challenges because 200 buses uh, a day need 200 drivers plus more then throughout the day to keep the service going pretty much around a 21 hour day. And there lies our issue, is, is co the communication aspect with drivers, making sure that they can um, see the benefit of, of driving in the most safe and efficient manner um, to, to encourage growth. But the, the information and the, the live data is, is absolutely superb and, and it can only um, improve things for us. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Giles Perkins, Business Development Director for Moose Shell. Uh, we're a transport and engineering consultancy. Um, I'm sector lead for uh, network information, customer experience, and the whole area of connected and autonomous vehicles. So I'm particularly interested in how our networks perform, how we can uh, use data to improve the traveler's experience, not on public transport, in private transport, and the changes that are happening right now in terms of uh, driver assistance, connected vehicles, autonomous vehicles, and what that might mean, not only for uh, the private car, but for hauliers, and basically everything on our highway. So it's a rapidly changing area, um, particularly in relation to customer information and how that's uh, got out to drivers. Uh, the whole issue of freight and the importance of, a bit like Nats, the importance of real-time data for freight and that, those logistics, considering that underpins our economy. And then the whole changes um, that are going to be forthcoming in cars over the next few years. Good morning. Hello, everyone. I'm Patrick Bosser, Transformation Director at Network Rail. Um, so we manage, operate, maintain, enhance the UK's rail infrastructure, and the railway has been a huge success since it was privatised in 1994. We've seen passenger numbers double um, over the last 20 years to 1.6 billion journeys per year, and it's set to double again over the next 30 years. Um, and in that sense, we're becoming a victim of our own success. The economy is hugely dependent on rail, um, both the service economy um, and the production economy. It's all about moving people and moving goods. Um, so we have a real challenge. The railway is practically full. There are many parts of it that uh, are overcrowded. 
Um, and we've been looking at that from a digital point of view to see what we can do to make far better use of the resources we have today. And the Nat's presentation, Simon, your presentation, um, really shows us the way. Uh, we've been looking at exactly the same type of technologies, digital collision avoidance technology, digital traffic management technology. Um, and what it means is the old Victorian signaling system that keeps trains apart and does a very, very good job um, in doing that safely. It's there for collision avoidance, but it's very, very inefficient. Um, basically, the railway is divided up into sections. You can't put a train into a section until the preceding train has left, which means that roughly half our railway is empty at any one time, yet we find because of the signalling, we can't put more trains on it. Um, so by moving to taking away all this fixed block signalling, by moving to dynamic uh, train control, traffic management, essentially exploiting all the digital technologies that we've just seen and heard about, and the sort of refinements to traffic management, um, we think that we can bring about a pretty radical revolution using today's railway infrastructure. Um, as building new lines in some areas is necessary, but we know it's hugely expensive and hugely disruptive. Um, and we certainly think that uh, we can deliver a railway uh, with much better performance and capacity and capability and reliability and safety uh, from the infrastructure we have today. Thank you. Um, so you, you, I already introduced myself, Simon Day, can you, you kind of have a reasonable idea of what Nats does by now, hopefully. Um, to build on some of the points that, uh, um, that were teased out there, some of the things that's really interesting for us at the moment is that overall system of systems, how transport works together as one overall whole. Um, because again, I think, uh, as all of us will recognise, when one person catches a cold, everybody else gets it as well, um, whether it is a, an issue with um, a, 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 um, the weather, and that means that maybe we've got some delays and that will have an impact on the railways, have an impact on the, on the roads. Conversely, a major incident on the roads also means that people can't get to airports, can't get to other things. So, so uh, passengers and freight, uh, the, the overall system of how they all link together actually needs to operate much more as one. I think traditionally that's been quite difficult to do simply because the information and the data wasn't there. I think what you're seeing as well is all of us are now starting to get much more uh, uh, integrated with the information we have, improving our own systems. I think the real leap then is how we as, um, as the consumers ultimately start to consume services services in different ways that actually enable the, the, the transport infrastructure providers to do things in a different way. How many of you book a flight based on what time it takes off rather than what time it leaves? And I suspect that's true for other people. Um, actually, uh, we need to trust the technology more uh, um, to allow us to get the better experience. I was a victim myself today driving here from the New Forest. I thought I knew better than my sat-nav did and ended up in a traffic jam. I should have trusted the technology. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, from, I'm from DVLA, as introduced before. So a lot of the focus we have around our digital services have been citizen-centric at this point. So abolition of tax disc. Today, as I sit here, quite nervously, we've released the abolition of the counterpart, which has been on the news this morning. Um, so technically, I think one of the things I, which I'm going to open up to the panel is I think there are a lot of capabilities that, that are available to us now. Uh, we've been talking to the motor industry about the machine-to-machine -machine aspects, which is very exciting. I mean, if you go to the extremes of, a, say, a science fiction view of it, where cars just fly down the highway, rather like the aircraft, missing each other by milliseconds, you know, the technology, in effect, is available in labs, you know, in organisations now. Applying it to vehicles is very difficult. So some of the issues that we are facing are, for example, driverless cars. You know, when you are driving a car and a hedgehog runs out or a pram comes out, you're probably going to unfortunately squash the hedgehog and save the pram. When you're in a car, how is the car going to make those decisions? So a lot of the things we wrestle with are less so technology-wise, but more legislation, policy and safety. So I'm going to open up to the panel now, and I'll, I'll look for someone to volunteer to take the mic, as to how far they think they are with the, the technology side, the art of the possible, to what the inhibitors are to get them to move forward at the pace they want to. Patrick? Okay, thanks, Ian. Um, I think for the railway, most of the technology we need exists today. Um, we, we've seen it in the aviation space. Um, we've seen plenty of industries that have got that level of safety in their production management and control. So there's no reason why we can't be applying it. Uh, the timescale, because the technology exists as well, uh, I think we're 
looking to be really ambitious and do the, the whole railway rollout nationally in 15 years. So you need technology that works today. Um, so our worry isn't so much the technology, it's about making sure that the right standards are in place so that we can interoperate with Europe because it is an interconnected network, especially for freight. Um, and the biggest challenge for us is actually around people and behavior. Um, and we have uh, an industry with 200-year-old traditions, very set ways of doing things, and taking people with us on that journey is really, really important. So we have a lot to learn from what happened in aviation, um, where that change happened in the 1980s and happened very, very successfully. I think turning to roads, um, <clears throat> Technology in some areas is very well progressed. So network information, for instance, use of uh, floating vehicle data, connected vehicle data to, um, particularly on the strategic road network, look at the performance of the network, rather than using fixed infrastructure, is very, very advanced uh, in this country compared to most of the world. I think on the connected vehicles front, the analogies are very similar to the railways in that um, some technology exists. Part of the problem, is that the claims that are made in the press about the Jetsons view of the world is somewhat far off, but the counterpoint to that is you can go out and buy a Fiat 500 that has got lane assist and adaptive speed control and all the other gizmos that effectively allow you to dump it in the middle lane and it'll drive itself with, you've got to have your hands on your wheel and your feet on the pedals, but it's changing the nature of our road networks. I think the progression of how technology gets rolled out will be influenced by some of those big players and it, it always comes down to Google, etc. But it's equally with the vehicle manufacturers. It exists in academia and research, particularly in the UK, that are very, very active. But it will be a progression and that progression will need a behavioral response. It will need a legislative response. It will need a discussion with society about how it reacts and what it finds useful. Um, it's hugely interesting. Is it led by the market? Is it led by technology? Is it led by individuals? I don't know. We'll have to see. Okay, I mean, from, from a bus perspective, I think what's, I suppose what's interesting to note is the advent of technology in buses, and, and bear with me here, it's quite frustrating as an operator because in this country, we, there, there is no technology, to, oh, there's no support for green buses. Now, if you go across the border, you have the technology there you have green buses operating on English roads and in, on Scottish roads, but that required a lot of political will to support operators to be able to implement that. In Wales, we haven't got that. So if there are going to be advances down the line, it's important that the political will is there to support that so operators like ourselves can have support to uh, deploy those on our roads. So I would build on some of the comments that already made as well in terms of I think it is um, changing the political scene, changing the, um, uh, the, the human side of it that is the hard part of this. Uh, and again, it, often people uh, use technology as a reason to do something differently uh, and not necessarily what it was there to do. Uh, I touched on earlier on how, for example, we uh, um, uh, try and reduce queuing by slowing people down en route. And again, I've seen this in the road networks where you go around the M25 and these variable speed limits um, to manage that. Uh, actually, though, is then people often race, and then the same thing we found, they race to get there quicker, so then they're slowed down and they think they're going to be further ahead in the queue. And we've had exactly the same problem because people knew we were applying speed constraints, they speed up further out to get the, the constraint quicker. And so I think some of the real challenges here, the technology uh, is there, although again, I completely agree with the point made earlier on around standardization. Uh, but you have to look much wider than just our own area, just our own economies. Whether in the aviation industry, and we're dealing with, with, with planes coming from all over the world, again, from a freight perspective, a passenger perspective, from an information perspective, this is a global marketplace. We need those inter interoperability standards, but we also need to change the way people are um, thinking and, uh, uh, and how they react to the technology to understand its benefits so that actually we can deliver the benefit. Uh, uh, often at times people don't see why the benefit's for them. I think one of the biggest challenges we've got is actually where the benefit is for the end user, not necessarily the organisations involved as well. Um, because sometimes the benefit will be seen system-wide, will be seen worldwide, and actually for individual organisations it's often very difficult to make the business case for doing it. Uh, thanks, Simon. I think that, that's absolutely right. I think what, one of the things that comes across to me quite clearly is whether it's market-led, I think most of the time it's user because the user will drive, in fact, what people see as the market opportunity. 
Um, with that in mind, how much of your industries are user-centric and how much user data are you using to profile the uptake of the digital technology trends and initiatives within your organizations? I'll, pass, I'll ask Charles first. Actually. I think it's interesting on highways that the, the concept of consumers or customers is only really starting to gel which I find, I'm a transport planner by background, so I find it really interesting. I came from a rail background and I'm now in highways. The concept of customer is interesting because I think that changes things. Um, it makes it easier for those customers to be engaging uh, with that system they use. So if you take the, the changes from Highways England, sorry, Highways Agency to Highways England, Transport Focus, ORR, brings that network onto the same footing of the, that the railways have been through in that progression since 1994. Um, I think that changes the dynamic because customers can feel engaged and contribute to, to their journeys more. So point-to-point -point journey planning starts to become more important, particularly across modes, which starts to address some of these issues around delays, congestion, etc. Um, whether that changes the customer's view of the network and they tr start to treat it more as a utility, I think is interesting because that's one of the missing parts one can argue with with roads is that they're just there and people expect them to be there without considering the cost of them being there. So perhaps a more customer-centric view might deliver a utility approach to highways. Um, in the railway, I think we've still got a long way to go to be truly customer-centric. Um, and part of the challenge is in 1994, the industry was privatized and effectively fragmented. So the train operators own the customer relationship. But with that, they also own all of the customer data. As an industry, we don't have a consistent view of demand data, of the journeys people are making, where they're going from and to, and so on. So part of getting the railway into the digital age is to agree some standards and means for sharing data so that we have a really good common view of demand and we can then adjust supply to, to meet that demand. And through digitizing the transport, we can put a lot more supply into the system, but it's an up to 40% on the existing railway in certain places. Um, but that's complete waste. If we can't configure the supply to meet the passenger demand as part of a proper multimodal transport picture, and then we can't make that data available to, to the passengers themselves so that they can treat rail like any other transport service. I'd really build on that. Um, we, we have exactly the same issue, which is Nats as an organisation that's uh, uh, little heard of, uh, and sadly it's normally when the pilot comes on to say there's air traffic control delays, which is normally not the case as well, um, that you normally hear about us, because again, our relationship with the customer is actually one step removed. Our relationship is with the airlines and the airports, the actual customers, the people that are having the experience uh, are, are one step removed. Uh, and that generates some interesting problems for us, and in the same way as we don't see the information noise that allows us to make the most beneficial decisions and again there needs to be a real industry transformation here in terms of how we share information I'll give you a real world example takeoff weights of aircraft are actually quite closely guarded because you can work out how much they're carrying how well an airline is doing but again is for us and knowing the takeoff weight gives us a lot better capability to model where that aircraft's going to go how it's going to get there how quickly it's going to climb uh, that kind of stuff we can't share that information today because people closely guard it I think there's a real opportunity to democratize the information in the network, that bigger transport network, um, to share that information more broadly and more widely to us to all to improve decision making and map supply to demand. Uh, and I think there are ways that are happening that people can try and protect that data but I think new technology is changing the way we do these things as well. People are now, oh, you know, as we can see you can, you can gain access to data such as live traffic data from, from Google or other sources which traditionally didn't have available which we can use to map. I think if we can all make a uh, uh, our data more available uh, and democratize the data sets and actually we can improve the overall uh, uh, case for everybody. But again, that requires change to business models, requires change to regulation, it requires standards. It's, it's, it's a difficult thing to do unless the whole industry gets together. I think um, something that we've seen as, as an operator, the, um, obviously the, the advent of mobiles and smartphones has had a, had a huge impact on us and, and we've try to make use of that as much as possible. So somebody's mobile phone can become ultimately their, their ticket machine. So they can produce their own ticket, they can buy their ticket, um, they can see exactly where their bus is and how long, how long it's gonna take to, to get there. I think that's something um, 
that, that we've noticed a, a huge, huge op uh, opportunity for us to, to make use of. And similarly, making available um, the data that has been thrown back from, from the, the ticket machine, which exactly shows where by bus it is, is a massive opportunity to enhance our uh, our customer base. Um, you know, we're a, we're a relatively small operator when you think of the whole of the UK, but we try and make use of this data as much as possible. And if, if op operators like ourselves can bring that on, and then it, it just paves the way for other operators across the UK to be able to, to do the same thing. So it, it gets rid of that fragmented approach, I suppose, as we, as we have at the moment. No, thank you. I think it's fascinating for me because um, I look at it, whose data is it anyway? And where is the source of that and how can you accumulate that? With that, with that in mind, uh, one of the things which I'm passionate about is opening data up. So if, when it's government data, it's actually everybody's data, in effect. As long as it's not breaching anybody's privacy or security, uh, that's something we should try and do. If we were to do that within government, how would that benefit your organisations as far as making sure you could actually advance your digital progression transformation? So, so opening up data would be hugely valuable for everybody involved. I think the challenge, though, is, is the cost of that data. Um, so to give, you, uh, to give you an idea, a huge cost for us is uh, 23 very expensive radars sitting on the top of hill generating that data, and it's the, it's the sole source. As a business, we can't afford to give that data away because we have to manage and maintain that infrastructure, which is purely there to create data. There's no other reason that is there. Um, so whilst we are really passionate about opening up data, actually we need to find the right business models that support that and again that's whether it's a privatized company like Nats or, or Network Rail uh, our, re our regulatory model incentivizes us uh, to invest in assets I think one of the things that is going to really challenge us in the future is in this data centric world the assets become uh, uh, not necessarily physical bits of things on, on a hill or, or tracks on the ground um, but actually we might need to move to more service based models and actually provision of data as a service but again, that's going to quite a big change in regulation. And we're going to have to recognize the fact that at the end of the day, data does normally cost. It's not free at the point of provision. Yeah. So I echo the need to open up data. It's vastly important for us, um, both within rail as a system, so the railway as a system, and how that system fits into the broader transport picture. Ultimately, customers want to know for any journey they're taking, the, the amount of time or the length of time it's going to take the cost of that journey or the journey option and the level of comfort they can expect for that cost. And not only with passengers, but with freight customers, they're looking at similar things. Uh, journey options, costs, weight, uh, wagon availability, journey times and so on. Um, that's vitally important that that data is openly available. And certainly the load factor or the relative comfort, whether that's crowding on trains and seat availability or number of people on planes, is very closely guarded. Yet to, to deliver a better customer service, that stuff absolutely has to be open. And then in the bigger picture, understanding demand data and overall journey data means that we can invest better in the infrastructure in the right places to deliver a better service for the future. I think it's interesting in highways, um, a lot of that progression has already been made through the use of floating vehicle data, which is extensively used to model what's happening on the highways to augment traditional sort of loop camera radar detection. That change as we go forward will mean less reliance on traditional infrastructure and more reliance on a crowdsourced, in inverted commas, solution, which starts to get interesting when you think through the sort of monetization and perhaps economics of that and, and customers engaging with transport, i.e. is there a model that they're going to give data to get something in return? So the contribution of lots and lots of points of real-time data of people traveling, be it from their home, driving on a car to a park and ride, getting on a bus, going to a train station to get to the airport to fly off, that data set is hugely valuable, and the more data that's collected across those modes allow those decisions to be made. And I think it's very interesting because we're on the cusp of something very big with this, provided that the agencies can start to share that, that information. I, I read a really interesting statistic this morning that over nine in ten Scania trucks in, this UK, uh, in the UK are now connected to their logistics hub. And that's fascinating if you think that... The, haulage is so advanced and moving around so that connectivity is already happening we will start to see it with private car through things like e-call and the next generation of vehicles are having these things built in so the opportunities are there to start to do something different if we can get 
well, people that use smartphones, particularly younger generation, are happy to contribute data through Facebook and other apps. So there's, there's a rich data set being connect, collected. It's about joining those dots together for transport to give a much richer, more valuable, demand-led answer. I think I echo that everything that has been said, really. I suppose we, we share our uh, current data. So if you, if you take a, a bus's location, for example, that is shared through our real-time information system so our customers can see uh, how long their bus is going to take to get there. But sort of building on some of the other points, wouldn't it be great that if, if I'm in uh, our control room and, and I can see our lines of, of operation and I can see everything that's happening in advance, I think that, you know, if people, you know, if agencies opened up that sort of information and then we were able to overlay our real-time info on there, then you know, certainly um, it, it would make our operation a lot more attractive, yeah. Uh, I'll just sort of continue a little bit on the, on the vein of the data side, because I think a lot of the data th items that we refer to are actually already there. So we already have people with their smartphones, with their locations on. We have them associated to, to vehicles, which have got locations on. Um, so I think a lot of the data around the, the, the motoring sector in particular is already already there. I think rail is a, a different case in there, but it probably won't be long before you're picking up people's data with inside the, the carriages, etc. But as you say, the problem is, the inhibitor is that's the operator's sort of privilege, but actually is there something we can do to actually start to open the, that sort of data avenue up more, and how rich would it be? I just want to go back to some of the, the, the vehicle pieces, and particularly on the, the highways uh, stuff with Giles, is that um, I recently went to, to look at highways and found that a lot of the data that was actually being collected was being anonymized and then you sent off and then came back as what I call information, which wasn't actually the rich source of data which everybody could potentially tap into, you know, such as Simon's a coach company. So it, do you think we ought to have some kind of standards that are set perhaps through government, because I'm from that side of the fence, as some of my colleagues here are, that allows, um, if you like, some of the private sector, but actually probably would be quite damaging to private sector in some way if we were to open it up? I think it's an interesting one. Um, there's a large amount of data that one could collect from traditional sources, um, so fixed infrastructure, observational sources. There are lots of other companies that have commercial models that make money from collecting data in different guises, be that mobile phone source data, be it via apps, etc. I think my view is it will be ultimately a blend of different sources of data. And the anonymization part, I think, is, is the important bit of it around privacy, et cetera. But once you get very, very large, significant um, volumes of probes within any given data, data set or segmented transport set, it starts to become more valuable particularly in the dark periods at night where traditionally there's not a lot apart from wagons moving around. As we start to collect more data, we'll get a, a, a more rich data set. So I think the challenge is to, the challenge will be around the commercial model. I don't think if you go down the route of saying that all the commercial organizations have to release that data, suddenly I would expect a lot of the data to disappear because people are making money from it. The reason that the large internet corporations have mapping, etc., is to generate ad revenue. It's not done for some philanthropic reason. I think it needs people like us, people in the room, um, boys in sheds, creating ideas to come up with different ways that that can be monetized and value attached to it. I think that's the key to unlocking it, is more of those, the societal parts of it. Why do we travel? What are the benefits of travel? I think that's the important part for me. Simon, if you want to comment on that before we move to Patrick. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's interesting, as an operator, you know, our data is, is hugely sensitive. You know, the, the location of, of a bus is, is, is one thing and it helps the c consumer, but everything else that we collect is, is hugely sensitive. And, and whether that's passenger um, uh, trends on, on where they catch their bus, where they get off their bus and so on. Um, to, to share that sort of information, as I think Charles said, is, is hugely sensitive. And, and I suppose we would need um, some convincing of, of the benefits of doing that. Yeah. I I agree about the sensitivity we've seen firsthand in the railway, um, an initiative which was to provide free Wi-Fi on all trains to all passengers nationally, um, which failed with only two train operators subscribing to it um, because of an issue over who owned the data. 
and the operators wanted exclusive use of that data, um, but clearly, as a free service, the mobile operators wanted sort of primary access to that data. That shows just how much people understand the value of data in service provision today. So anything we do in the digital railway program in trying to bring about major change is really based on understanding the money go round in the industry and making sure that there's something in it for everyone in whatever new model we propose. And sometimes, you know, I, I work for Network Rail, but I'm working on an industry-level program here. Um, and sometimes that's, that means tough news for people, and certainly for Network Rail, some of the stuff we're looking at means less money, less track access charge, and so on. Um, but in the end, to move an industry forward, we have to make sure the right incentives are in place for everybody there. The thing I'd add to that as well is one of the things that, that again, we've seen is the progression of the digital technology has actually um, forced people to democratise their data sets. In terms, again, you take our, so I mentioned our radars earlier on, actually uh, um, uh, manufacturers of apps, the coders of apps now have their own ground-based infrastructure monitoring the availability of aircraft. Um, so actually, um, the data itself can become democratised, and I'm sure it's true in other industries where actually new entrants are coming along, finding ways of creating the data, which actually means your data uh, perhaps has less value. Yeah, we might have the most perfectly aligned picture of where every aircraft is in the sky, but again, if you want crowdsourced, relatively low-fidelity data, there's many other ways you can get it. Uh, you can get it. So actually, uh, I think the challenge the industry is you're better off opening up and being part of the game rather than trying to protect yourself uh, and forcing people to innovate around you. Um, the other thing I would just say as well, building on some of the standards, this is something that the uh, aviation industry has tried hard and is still trying hard at and is not there yet, is standards for interoperability around data. We have a concept called SWIM, which is a global uh, concept called system-wide information management. It's, it's all about sharing information across all of the actors within the aviation industry. Our standards are still relatively immature. And one of the things we are trying, we as an organisation, Nats are trying to do, is encourage people to give it a go and start sharing information, even if the standards aren't perfect, because it's better to to get information moving uh, and start sharing it to to enhance the standards rather than rating for the perfect standard. But in a world where there's a lot of cost in these things, and again, changing airframes is very expensive, people are often very nervous about investing until things are perfect. I don't think you can wait to do that in the digital age. So if we look at that, the, all the queries that still raise around data the actual technologies are moving at a pace. I think we always find that the ultimately somebody will find a way around it because, again, as Patrick quite rightly says, it's commercial, the value of the data is there, therefore the power of the app and the, the money that's going to be brought in by that will allow somebody to go and find a way of giving that information in some other way. If we take that into account, plus the, if like the march of technology, um, what do we see the next three years looks like in our particular industry? Um, from my perspective, uh, sadly, I don't think um, it's going to move um, from the aviation perspective hugely, a huge distance in three years. I think you'll have a much more connected environment. I think we'll be sharing much more data. Uh, I actually think people will be more, will making more use of that. Uh, people are already uh, checking in for their flights. I see uh, a revolution more there in, in more end-to-end -end ticketing in terms of actually people um, uh, uh, integrating an entire journey from, from, from home to, to destination. Uh, I think that's going to be enabled by disruption of, uh, of uh, disruptive technologies and, and apps in a world that already exists. I don't think we need the new technology. I think we need to find the ways to exploit it. I think in rail, you'll see much better data for customers in terms of cost of journeys, so the sort of sky scanner, but for rail, as more of that data gets opened up. You'll see much better timetable data and train running information. It's not bad at the moment, but it's a bit approximate. It's going to become very accurate with proper tracking of trains. Um, however, time, cost, Comfort, the comfort factor is still missing, and I think we're going to have to work really hard to get that in place over three years because of all the commercial challenges around that particular information set. I think on highways, the um, particular strategic highways, quality, timeliness of information will improve dramatically over the next three years. We'll start to see further enhancements of connected vehicles and what that means. So that might mean more data in vehicle, which would be great. We're going to start to see the rise of infotainment. So consuming entertainment-based data in vehicle will be an interesting one because it's going to start to put huge demands on 
uh, 3G, 4G networks. And we'll start to see this evolution from traditional vehicles, the car has been pretty much the same for the last 100 years, into a disruptive version of the car um, and a disruptive version of HGVs and vans. That's going to be a 20 year journey, um, but we'll start to see the start of that in the next three years. I think the, um, the continued evolution of the way people are going to pay for their journeys for us, I think uh, contactless payments are not far away. Obviously, they're, they're in London. We see them uh, operating there. So for us, I think that's the next step, and that, that is quite possible within the next three years. But, but sort of a, a point I made earlier, I hope to see that uh, we're going to get more green buses or get green buses full stop, really, in Wales, because that's something that's long overdue. The technology's been there for a long time, but I think that's what we'd like to see in the next three years. Uh, just from, from our side of it, I think from the lay side, what, what we are seeing is that actually as we start to transform the way that agency in particular works, is how much of that data is repeated, how much those process are repeated, and how much we can streamline that down. For to us, um, it means far more services for, for the public, but, and also from a compliance side of it, why are we replicating things that other organisations such as insurance companies are doing? And therefore, to try and streamline that further, we have to reevaluate what that whole role is of government agencies in line with making sure we can still make sure that vehicles should be on the road, people are safe on the road, and we're collecting the right data to make sure we can progress that. The one thing that strikes me, though, with all, these, all the future views is that it's heavily reliant upon having the right technology and digital skills. And some of the items talked about before about understanding the, the behavior analytics, if you like. So, having the right analytical skills with the right people, people behavior aspects and use experience to try and make these visions come true. What do you think, where do you feel we are as a, as a nation as far as creating those digital skills? It's something you're passionate about and some people local to Wales when I understand the work that we've been doing with DVLA around the universities, etc. What sort of things do you think are going to be the inhibitors and how are you going to overcome those? Uh, ab absolutely. So, so um, we employ about 800 uh, engineers and, and another probably 200 um, scientists on top of that. And actually, it's a, an absolute critical focus for us. We still have a, uh, a graduate entry scheme. We still have industrial placements. We are trying to build uh, that pipeline of, of skills for the future because actually those... Those skills like data science, not just being able to understand data, but actually uh, really uh, apply it to business problems and really understand uh, how you can build predictive models. These skills are, are really hard to find, uh, and we're having to invest in that pipeline to get them there. Uh, I think for me, the, uh, it's interesting. A lot of people say, oh, well, uh, engineering is um, uh, uh, not what it used to be. Actually, from my perspective, it's a lot more interesting. Uh, yeah, we might not be oiling our radars as much as we once were, um, but actually we are spending a huge amount of time, money, and more effort than ever um, really getting under the skin of the information, using that information and doing different things. So I think there's some really exciting careers. I think there's a real value there. And actually, I think the other big change is it's going to be a lot more repurposable. I think there's going to be a lot of digital skills that are repurposable between different industries rather than being an expert in one particular domain. I think you'll see much more transferability of uh, digital skills uh, between different industry segments. And we see the skills agenda in two areas. The first is in digital train control where clearly those technologies have been developed in other industries. They're sort of developing in rail. Um, there is a huge opportunity for the UK to lead the skills agenda in digitizing national scale rail operations. So we're working with the supply chain um, on the sort of university relationships, skills academies, and all the other things that need to be built to support what is a new industry. Um, that's on the sort of heavy industrial digital train control. On the information side, we think the more you open that information up and just let other people be creative with it, um, the, the more of an explosion of really interesting services there's going to be. And there's no shortage of skills in that space. I think there's just a shortage of information. I think if you take transportation um, in the round, uh, moving from predictive modeling to real-time modeling is going to be a huge challenge and hugely interesting. The computational and modeling skills, analytics, algorithmic skills will become essential going forward, particularly as we start to connect uh, vehicles to infrastructure, vehicles to each other. Real-time 
modeling to assess how networks are performing so that decisions can be made, so that the one direction sort of argument of how, how does Cardiff perform when you've got a massive influx of people, how do we control the highway network, how are vehicles interacting with each other, it's back to the demand point, how can we collect data that allows us to manage those networks. So as we move from a predictive model, which in transportation we're all used to, and we've done it in railways and roads forever, that's how we justify schemes to a more real-time model. It's going to take significant skills and experience. It's going to need a different set of transport planning skills. It's going to need a lot of skills that come from places like gaming and other digital industries where vast amounts of data are moved around in different ways. So I think this, it's interesting exciting. We need different views, different people um, to come and join the party. I think answering as an operator, I think one of, the, one of the big things we face is is the fact that there's just so much data, and interpreting that data is it, it takes some doing, and the traditional structures that you would normally have in an industry like ours uh, are being ripped up because you have to interpret that data, and you need people feeding that information out to say, you know, if if it's a timeliness issue or if it's a safety issue, it's all being fed through through the systems that we have. So it's addressing the skills gaps that we've gotten. And I think you know there's a, there's a complete different generation that are going to be growing up in, in the transportation industry now. Yeah, that's, that's great. And I'd like to thank the panel for, for the, I think it's been a very interesting um, topic. And uh, maybe we are the only ones that really are focused on it. But I would like to throw out if there are any questions at all from those that are remaining, to see if there's anything you want to ask us while we're all here. I can't see the hand. Hi there. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, just a bit slightly confused by the tone of the, the panel. There's some really good stuff being discussed. But, um, I think it's something like 80% of the world's data has been created in the last two years. Uh, up until 2015, I think, one billion users have been on the internet. By 2018, it'll be two billion. Uh, and the panel are talking about the explosion in data and infotainment and blah de blah and explosion of this and that. The explosion has already happened, so... Are you not behind the curve, guys? Does anyone want to take that first? I think if you're being critical, um, you could argue that transportation is behind the curve because the, the internet came along 20 years ago and people reacted it, uh, to it in lots and lots of creative ways. Uh, transportation as an industry, you can argue, is um, led by lots of people with oily rags who, who oil radars and build railways and do those sorts of things. Because uh, you could argue that there's lots of uh, safety critical systems in transportation uh, with, with different needs and different drivers and operators, uh, maintainers are reacting in ways that allow them to make incremental change. I think some of the changes that are coming that are led by the connectivity of some of these machines starts to drive that agenda much quicker. Um, so I, I would kind of agree with you, yes. Um, but I think the pace will increase rapidly. Yeah, yeah I, I would build on that as well. I think one of the things that makes the transportation industry um, uh, uh, difficult to change fast is the investment in infrastructure, be it roads, be it your own vehicles. I mean, uh, if, you, if you had car as a service uh, and actually you could upgrade your car every journey and take the new technology, that'd be great. But how many of us change their cars every week, let alone years, or, or I mean, most of the time it's years. It, and it's the same across the industry. There's a lot of investment and a lot of infrastructure um, that actually takes a very long time to, 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 to change, just because uh, you can't afford to replace it that quickly. The other thing I would say, uh, and I think this is, is, is similar for, for most, most parts of the tr transportation industry, safety has to remain paramount. Is we're moving human beings around, actually safety has to be at the core of what we're doing, and we have to make sure the technology is tried, tested, and mature enough, and we understand it before uh, we actually put uh, it, it into service. And these things do take time, uh, and we need to make sure we do that in the right way, because actually um, the, the big issue is if somebody did rush something, and actually that became a, a cause of a safety incident, actually uh, the impact that would have, I think that would take us back a lot further than, than we're progressing. Um, I was just about to, to um, come in on Giles's point around safety, but um, we have to almost be a bit behind the curve to exploit technologies. Um, certainly as a, a government and taxpayer-funded organisation, 
Um, we have to deliver best value from what's out there. So far rather, seed some stuff, see what happens, take the best out of other industries, and when we know it works, exploit it. Um, but even that, the Digital Railway Programme is compressing a 50-year plan of investment in rail infrastructure into a 15-year period to deliver the same sort of outputs by exploiting digital technology. That might not seem lightning fast or an explosion, but actually, in the journey of major heavy infrastructure, that is a pretty quick transformation. So uh, I think we're fast followers than leaders. Yeah, I think we are behind the curve. That's a, that's a definite. Um, certainly as an operator, you know, one of our ways of finding out whether the bus was on time was relying on the driver calling us in and letting us know. Um, that, that left us not that long ago. <laughs> so using the, the GPS tracking systems that we have, we were able to then say, actually, don't call us, we'll call you. But we are, we are behind the curve, definitely. Yeah, I'd, I'd just close that one off is that, you know, we are, we're not digital businesses. We're businesses that are using digital to enhance and drive forward the transformations in our industries. And yes, you're right, there's been an explosion, but the explosion sort of is ricocheting around. It's given us the ability to move faster, but when digital hits physical, hits legislation and policy, you do start to see the treacle coming in, and it takes time to move. And by the time we've actually started to move in that way, we'll see that technology has moved forward yet again. So it's about having the right investment, the right time, and the right people involved in those things to make the most of that digital journey. Okay, are we out of time? Pretty much, yeah. right. Are there any more questions before we close off? Anyway, um, so in terms of um, logistics data and operational data is what you guys have been talking about a lot today. What about customer satisfaction? Um, have you seen any best practices in the industry, you know, sort of um, customer feedback, customer reviews, things like that? What sorts of things have you seen in the industry um, that have worked, uh, maybe with, you know, businesses you've worked with or, you know? Um, if, if I take that one, I think social media is a, is a fantastic um, way of communicating two-way. Uh, for us with our consumers. Um, we, we've had a lot of explosions today, but we definitely had an explosion about three years ago with some real bad weather in Cardiff, and we found that using our uh, Twitter feed, it was the best way of communicating directly with people. And, you know, the number of followers that increased over a very short period of time, and what we've learned to do is to, try, is to maintain that. So if, you, you know, if the, the information is getting out there that you know, there's a delay and we're able to target exact services, exact people you know, um, through the social media, that, that's, that's how we've embraced that. So um, that's the biggest game changer for us, definitely. I think just to add to that, the moving social media from just a, a, a push and a pull to more sentiment analysis type approach, I think is a big opportunity for transport in terms of running sentiment analysis, looking at dissatisfaction as it's happening and then reacting to that dissatisfaction, I think is a, an interesting challenge uh, going forward. And we're looking at um, how to get input, not only from social media, but crowdsourcing so that we get a unified set of objectives as an industry. At the moment, as an infrastructure operator, we're rewarded for trains arriving at their end station on time. It doesn't actually technically matter if they're late all the way in between, um, or if people can't even get on the trains. So it's really important to us that they, the measures for the future are consistent between us and the train operators and really informed by customers, crowdsourcing data and social media in a way that, that really makes us fully accountable for the service that we provide. I think it was Douglas Adams that said the only thing that moves faster than the speed of light is the speed of bad news. Mm -hmm. And I think um, Twitter and um, social media has really um, brought that to the fore. So I, I think for me, the, what the real challenge for the industry is to engage with that upfront um, and use that for the positive benefit of getting information out there and using it. Because disruption happens, be it weather, be it incidents, disruption will happen. Uh, uh, use those, those media channels to inform people and engage people and help them. Uh, uh, and I think actually then you can improve the customer experience. Um, I would say on my side, which is probably the safer everyone here, is that we, we are making fundamental changes to the way that DVLA is working. Uh, it doesn't have the same consequence if an aircraft falls out of the sky or a train hits the buffers. So we are using um, customer data and customer experience to drive the speed at which we change those services and migrate them. Um, we're just about to open up one of the largest, well, I think it's the largest south of Bristol user experience lab down in Swansea. 
to, to pick up that. We're working with the universities around it as well. It's absolutely the key of what we're doing. Uh, so yes, we do, and we don't always get it right, but what it does do in our agile world is build a, a, whole, a, a if you like, a, um, a group of backlogs by which we can start changing those services. We're also opening up the code to the public as well, which may sound dangerous to some ears, but that allows people to come back and tell us what they've done, what we may have done wrong or less efficient with that code, but it also means that they can build other things on top of that, so they can build apps that work with our systems as well. There is a, a, a line which we have to take some control over on that, but absolutely, the user is the centre of all things that are changing at the moment in DVLA. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, I am all that stands between you and lunch, so I'm just going to wrap up very quickly. A big thanks to uh, yep, um, Simon, Giles, Patrick, and Simon. Um, it's been fantastic hearing about uh, how digital is going to transform transport. Let's face it, transport tends to be one of the first things people bitch about. Uh, getting into work or getting home from work is always the, the challenge, but it sounds like there's some really good ideas here of how we can use digital to accelerate change uh, that's already happening. <laughs>